Hey guys, what's up and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be looking at the nature of the economic problem. This would be the first chapter in economics if you're doing the IGCSE 0455 syllabus. So let's begin with some key terms. Resources, what is a resource? A resource is basically the input required for the productions and of goods and services. Whenever you're producing something, you need those raw materials which are therefore called resources. Resources are basically the inputs required for the production of goods and services. What is the meaning of scarcity? Scarcity is a lack of something or is a situation whereby there is not enough to satisfy all the human wants and needs. Okay, why is this? This is because number one, that every raw material that we have or most of the raw materials that we have that are usually wants or even sometimes needs, uh, they are finite, uh, finite in resources, okay? This basically means that they're limited, okay? And because of the unlimited wants humans have, because it is a human nature to desire more and more. So an example would be like, if you live on a small house, you would want to upgrade in a bigger house and from bigger to bigger to bigger. So the wants keep increasing and it's the human nature and that can't be stopped. But when we look at this into the economic problem, we see that we don't have enough to satisfy everyone. And therefore, a situation whereby scarcity is formed, where scarcity is basically a situation whereby there is not enough natural resources or raw materials to satisfy the unlimited wants from humans. And therefore, economics basically handles this problem and how we can best allocate resources to everyone correctly. Next, we need to look at the economic goods. Okay, now we're moving so to some types of goods. Now, all of the raw materials that we use in the production are scarce. Okay, so the economic goods are basically those which are scarce in supply and so can only be produced with an economic cost or can be consumed with a price. This means that whatever you buy, for example, whenever you buy something in the supermarkets, those are all economic goods because number one, you are paying for that good. You are consuming. To consume, you are paying. And for example, in the producer's perspective, you are paying for those raw materials to make the good you want to sell. These are called economic goods. Economic goods have opportunity cost and we will look at what opportunity cost is. But for right now, I will say opportunity cost is the next best alternative to the good foregone. So basically opportunity cost is when you have to decide between two goods that you want to produce and the good that's foregone is the opportunity cost. So basically everything when you make a decision, there is always opportunity cost when producing and therefore economic goods have opportunity cost because you can decide what to produce with the money you have. Next up, we have free goods and from its name, free goods basically means that there is unlimited supply. Therefore, example would be like wind and uh, all of this would be natural resources. This is when the supply of it will not reduce and they're free for everyone. Like everyone can consume air. You don't need to pay to consume air. Everyone can have the sunlight. You do not need to pay for having the sunlight. And therefore, that is the distinguish between free goods and economic goods. So here are the quick terms. We looked at resources. We looked at scarcity. We looked at economic goods and we have looked at the free goods. Now comes the factors of production. Whenever we're producing something, there are factors that must be considered. And the first one that we are going to be look, looking at in the factors of production out of four is land. Okay, so let's start with land. Basically, all natural resources in the economy, which includes the surface of the earth, lakes, forests, minerals, deposits, uh, mineral deposits, climate, etc., have natural resources okay so the land we have has natural resources so everything that's in the land are natural resources and therefore comes the name land is also a factor of production because where you obtain those natural resources are from the land okay so land is basically uh, the natural resources found on or beneath the earth's surface that is when we look at it in terms of the production 
Then we have the reward for that, okay? Whenever we look at economics, we always look at what you get or the benefit out of this. You know, when you sell a good, what do you get? You know, what if the demand for this increases, what happens? So for this case would be the reward for land is rent, okay? So rent, so if you basically rent out land, okay, you're getting money from the rent, okay? Uh, so that is the reward for rent. The next one is since the amount of land in existence stays the same, its supply is said to be fixed. This means it cannot change. The supply of land is cannot be changed. Okay, what you have, you have. But what you can do is buy more land for your business, which basically means to expand. Okay, but then the supply of the land you have cannot increase no matter what you do. The only thing you can do is to buy more and more with the money that you pay for. The next one is the quality. How can we look at the quality of the land? The quality of the land depends on the soil type, the fertility, the weather. You know, if it's next to uh, volcanic areas, it, then for, you know, it will be fertile, the, the grass and all of that. So we look at conditions like that, okay? And uh, that's how the quality is decided depending on soil type, fertility, weather, and so many other examples but we will not go that in depth. All you need to know is the quality of land can be dependent on these three, four uh, factors. The next one, we looked at mobility, okay? In economics, we look at mobility when we are producing something. Mobility is basically the ease of changing its use or its purpose, okay? So when we say geographically immobile, that means that land cannot move geographically. It cannot move around. And that's why it is to be said geographically more immobile. Okay, if it was ge geographically mobile, I can change its location from one place to another place. But as I said, we look at um, the mobility in terms of the use and the location. So the location can't, uh, can't change, but the use can. And therefore, we say it's occupationally mobile. If it, there was no use, if you have only one use, if your good has only one use, if the if, if the factor of production has only one use, then it will be occupationally immobile. So there you go. That is basically land, reward, rent, supply to be fixed, quality depends on its factors, it is geographically immobile and occupationally mobile. Let's move on to labor. Labor is basically all the human resources available in an economy. Okay. Labor is all the human resources available in an economy okay and then later on we will talk about capital and we will talk about enterprise so when we look at labor labor is the human effort in producing a good or service okay this is the physical or mental effort that a worker has to go through to produce a resource and this is called labor and we have heard about labor everywhere uh you know when you're employed it's technically you are in the labor you are you're doing labor work okay and what is the reward for this we all know it's wages and salaries which is basically money so everything gives you the money for doing this work so the reward will be wages and therefore it's promoted that the harder you work the more the physical effort the more the mental the more the scale you have the higher the wages and salaries but now let's look at the supply okay we will look about we will look at the quality and all of that just later just in a minute but then the supply of labor depends on the number of workers available okay let's have a look at some of the examples number one is the population size for example china which is currently the most populated currently a country would have so many people available for supply of labor because all of them would need to work because for survival they need to work and therefore to obtain money they work and therefore the supply of labor will keep on increasing because of the big population they have the next one is the number of years schooling people that have very youthful uh, citizens in their country compared to retired uh, citizens that are old and that cannot work anymore will have uh, a s smaller supply of labor because those people are not going to be working and therefore there will be a shortage of supply but then those that are youthful the 18 years above you know around the 18 the 30s the 40s they will have a big supply of labor those countries that have many of those ages 
those age gaps will have a bigger supply because more of them will be able to work. The next one is the retirement age. Okay, in every country has their own retirement age. And if someone decides to just retire at 60 years old, then, uh, you know, the economy will be less. But then some countries that retire at 70, at 80, those countries will have a big supply all the way till there. Their time will be a lot of supply. And therefore, the youthful and the old will be working. So the supply will be very big. The next one is the age structure. The age structure, as I told you, youthful population and old population is almost similar to population size uh, and the years of schooling. The next one is the attitude towards women working. Now, many countries believe that women shouldn't work or maybe some professions basically support more men towards it. And therefore, the attitude towards working women is very important because if it's many women are working, therefore, the supply will be in great numbers. We then move on. The next one is the quality of labor. And the quality of labor will depend upon the skills, education and qualification of labor. So the quality depends on the skills, the education you have, and the qualification of labor. If you have uh, worked for a long time, if you have done more work, you're more skilled, learned more, then the quality of labor will be higher. The next one is the labor mobility. The labor mobility basically depends on various factors. Labor can achieve high occupational mobility if they have the right skills and qualifications. So labor mobility is if you basically change from one profession to another profession. But that's only if you can have the right skills and qualifications for that. It can also be geographically mobile because you can switch a country to work from there. But then factors are there, like people will not switch because of their family, for education, maybe for visa purposes and personal priorities or religion or the national laws and regulations on travel and work. So therefore, those are the factors of labor mobility. The next one we go over is capital and capital is all the man-made resources that are used in the production of goods and services. The reward for capital is interest. Okay, interest is received when you perform capital. Okay, or uh, when you have capital in your business or in the production of, of goods and services. The supply of capital depends on the upon the demand and uh, the demand for the goods and services, how well the businesses are doing, the savings in the economy uh, are the factors that affect um, capital. So how can the quality be changed or how can quality be a factor in capital? Now quality of capital depends on how many good quality products can be produced. That's basically the number of outputs that can be produced. And for example, the capital is said to be much more quality uh, uh, for example, the capital is said to be of much more quali quality in a car manufacturing plant that uses that uses great technology and advanced technology compared to someone that uses their hands or manual effort, that is labor. So therefore, capital comes into the uh, picture uh, where we use machines, that is capital. Capital, an example of capital would be machines. The next one we have is capital mobility and capital mobility basically depends on the nature and use of capital. For example, an office building is geographically immobile, but the occupationally mobile, on the other hand, a pen is geographically and occupationally mobile. So it depends on the good you're using or the capital that you're using in your business. Finally, we have the last one, which is enterprise and enterprise is the ability to take risks and run a business venture or a firm which is called enterprise. So a person who has enterprise is called an entrepreneur and ensure there are people that start a business and they take the risk to start a business and then organize all the factors of production and make decisions necessary to make their firm run successfully. The reward to enterprise is profit that is generated from the business. The supply of enterprise is dependent on the entrepreneurial skills, innovation, effective communication. So this is basically the skills of the person, of the entrepreneur in the enterprise of supply. If you are very smart, the supply of enterprise will be very good. Also, then we move on to some of the factors like education, corporate taxes, where taxes can be very high, profit can be low. And when no one wants to start a business, it can also be affected. And of course, regulations when starting a business. 
The next one is the quality of enterprise, which will depend on how well it is able to satisfy and expand demand in the economy using cost effective and innovative ways. So the quality depends again on your skill the entrepreneur has. An enterprise is usually very mobile, but both geographically and occupational. So all the above factors of production are scarce because the time people have to spend working in different skills they have on land on which firms operate, the natural resources they use are all limited in supply. And therefore, we have economics to save this problem. In the next video, we're going to be looking at opportunity cost and how this can be helped or how this can be solved using the help of opportunity cost. I did a brief introduction of opportunity cost in the start, but now we will look at the curves the proper definition, many examples that everyone has to take for opportunity cost and many more. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.